All right, let's talk Afghanistan because clearly that is uh, that is the thing. Now I've I've held off talking about it because I wanted a lot more information to come out during this kind of mass scale evacuation where we are tucking tail and running. There's a lot of stuff that's lost in the wash, and I wanted those details to come out so we could start to actually evaluate this from somewhat of a subjective point of view instead of an objective one. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people today are talking about Afghanistan in split terms. Some are looking at this as like, finally, just rip the bandaid off, get out. And some are looking at this as a the tragedy that it is. I used to be one of those people who was like, small scale, military intervention, get in, get out, be done, don't nation build. I used to think that way until I started studying what happens when we leave a power vacuum and we have people like China, who is, by the way, a border nation to Afghanistan and our number one geopolitical threat, moving in and using Afghanistan now as a staging area for them to build roads, for them to put infrastructure in place so that they can continue to harass India who is one of our allies. Just, you gotta look at the chessboard, all right? There, there, there's parts and pieces moving all over the place, and by abandoning Afghanistan to the tender mercies of China, um, we have literally robbed ourselves of a good place to stage and put troops on the ground in China if necessary, which is never a good thing because you always want to negotiate and start diplomacy from a place of power. You never want to be a diplomat who is begging for things. You want to be the diplomat who's setting the terms. And if we want a diplomatic resolution with China sometime in the future, if we want to put the thumb screws to them, we need to have the ability to do so, which means that we need to be a geopolitical threat to them, and we need to show them, in very real terms, that it is far better to work with us and be a friend, quote unquote, than to be an enemy. Because if you are our enemy, you are going to feel the full force and the brunt and the effects of all the devastation that we can rain down from above. However, again, we have put ourselves in a weaker geopolitical uh, position to negotiate with China just because of this idiotic withdrawal. Now, there are also a lot of people talking about the Afghan National Army. Joe Biden said this multiple times himself. He said, they're not willing to fight for themselves. Why should we fight for them? This is something that has been a pervasive myth, especially since 2014. 2014, NATO and the coalition forces, along with the United States, radically shifted our mission in Afghanistan. We drew down from over 100,000 soldiers in country in combat to a token force of 15,000 or so and kept drawing down from there. We kept scaling back the size of our operation in Afghanistan simply because the mission parameters had changed. The Taliban had been thoroughly beaten back into the tribal areas and uh, it, at that point in time it was time to essentially train Af the Afghanistan army to stand on its own. Now there was a massive massive failure in understanding of what Afghanistan is, who they are, and the best way to equip and train a fighting force that would be able to stand on its own against the Taliban. We thought, for some ungodly reason, that Afghanistan is just like us. So we built an army that essentially tried to operate like the United States. However, you might notice some major key differences between the United States and Afghanistan. Mainly that the logistical knowledge, the logistical understanding of how to run a formidable modern fighting force that includes armor, includes air, includes uh, artillery, is something that Afghanistan is not very good at. This can come from a variety of reasons, some ranging from, you know, the average Afghani doesn't have a very good education. So asking them to um, tie together supply lines, make sure the financials are in order, 
uh, ensure that you have this accurate uh, information spread and communications system in place that won't falter and fail uh, is almost impossible. We decided that the Afghanis were Americans at heart with all the benefits and privileges that we have had in our lives, uh, mostly being that our fighting force had an education and that we uh, could train them to fight like us. Not the case. Now, this is not underwriting several Afghanis who are excellent war fighters, who are excellent soldiers, who have learned how to fight in the modern era. However, again, this just is not a good example of why you're going to equip an entire fighting force. Now, the Afghanis historically and traditionally have been always a light infantry group. In fact, we can see that with what happened when we decided to go take Afghanistan. It was the Northern Alliance on horseback that actually rode against armor and somehow won. This is a fighting force that would have been much better off equipped and prepared to be a light uh, light infantry group that, re that used and utilized some good air assets that were coordinated and trained properly. Um, we did not do that. And the other thing that Afghanistan uh, pretty much fails in is they don't have a modern understanding of warfare. They just do not. It does not resonate with their commanders. It does not resonate with the people. So if you look at uh, essentially what Afghanistan is and the culture, the idea of tying together hundreds of thousands of troops in a formation that stretches several miles, that they didn't have the benefit of fighting in World War I and learning the hard lessons there, or World War II, or any of the subsequent wars from there that have evolved our un modern understanding of what warfare is and how it should be conducted in an effective manner. They do not have that. So, we trained them wrong, and we made them entirely reliant on U.S. air assets. And then, uh, on top of that, when we gave them their own air assets and trained them how to fly them, we did not train them particularly well on how to maintain those air assets, so that when we did withdraw, the one edge that they would have over the Taliban, which is, you know, air assets that can rain down holy hellfire from above, would effectively be grounded. The final thing that I want to point out here is that between 2014 and 2001, over 50,000 Afghanis have died in combat against the Taliban. And that's not including this modern push. No, this, this most recent push by the Taliban to take the entire country. No, that is combat operations from 2014 to 2001, essentially trying to keep the Taliban at bay. 50,000 casualties wouldn't take a tenth of that number in Afghanistan since 2002. So please understand that the Afghanis were fighting for their nation. They just did not have the appropriate training, the appropriate logistical system, or any sort of modern understanding of what it would take to hold their country. These are all things that we could have given them. And in fact, we could have avoided this whole debacle in Afghanistan had we just simply waited for the summer and spring fighting season to end. Now, for those who don't know, Afghanistan has fighting seasons. Essentially, once it gets to winter in Afghanistan, the country locks down just because the winters are so harsh. The Taliban are not able to move. Most fighting forces aren't, and they've never been able to do that. So, that being said, if we had just waited till, say, November, December to withdraw everything, at least the Afghanis would have had a few months breathing room to stabilize their fighting force in a way that they could effectively mount some sort of defense. On one final note, did you know we are paying the average Afghani soldier we were paying their salaries. Why? Because again, Afghanistan did not have, did not have the logistical support options to fit, uh, field an army of about 300,000 soldiers. 
They just didn't. So we do that. We pay over a million soldiers. So what did we do? We stepped in and we operated the financials for them. Now, if you are an Afghani, and a young Afghani man has joined the Afghan army, and suddenly you start receiving word that the Taliban are moving in on your position, and they're moving in in strength. And your commander has fled because he was a corrupt old piece of that just need to get out of the way. And the Americans are leaving toot sweet. These badass Americans who you look up to and you say, wow, these guys are really professional. I want to be like them. They're getting the hell out of Dodge. What does that do for your morale? I guarantee it saps it all the way down. So what do you do? Well, you probably call your family, you probably chew over your decisions a little bit, and then you realize that you haven't been paid. Hey, man, I'm, I'm not getting paid anymore. What the hell? Why should I stick around? Why should I go fight these guys? I can just kind of disappear into the, the roles of history. In fact, they're saying that because I was an ally to the United States, I might be able to get my family out. Of course they deserted. Of course they fled. Of course they're not mounting a resistance. Why should they? Why would they? they? Have some deep sense of patriotism? Their culture doesn't have that. It's all tribal. So why, why would they stay and fight? Just, just some food for thought. Well, as always, guys, if you like this video, make sure you uh, like and subscribe, hit that notification bell. That way you're always notified when I post new videos. Again, I'm trying to do these more often to figure out, hey, this YouTube thing and go from there. So as always, guys, thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.